welcome the sun, the clouds and rain, the wind that sweeps the sky clean and lets the sun shine again. This is the most magnificent life has ever been. Here is heaven and earth and the brilliant sky in between. Welcome to this electronic field trip. We are recording live from Grand Teton National Park here in Wyoming. And my name is Diane. And my name is Dylan. Today we will be learning about four communities in Grand Teton National Park. A community is an area where a lot of the same plants grow. And you can participate with us today on our show in three ways. The first is by calling in with your questions by phone. The second way is to go to our website and type in questions to our bank of experts. And the third way is to participate in our live Your Turn activity that we'll be doing today on the show. But before we start our show, we'd like to introduce you to the other rangers and students that are participating with us today. Let's head over to the fourth community to meet Mike and Emily. Howdy, my name is Mike. And I'm Emily, and we're in the forest community. Now let's see who's over in the wetlands. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, I'm Siler. Now let's see who's in the sagebrush community. Hi, I'm Kaylin. And I'm Kristen. Back to you, Diane and Dylan. Well, now that you've met everyone, why don't we go ahead and get started learning about these communities in Grand Teton National Park. Dispatch 0225 to Ranger oh 1002 McGee. Ranger McGee, please come in. Excuse me for just a minute. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, this is Ranger McGee. Go ahead. There's been a report of a bear sighting, most likely grizzly, in the forest community. We need a ranger to track the animal and assess the situation. Again, this is a potential grizzly sighting within the park. We need one of your rangers to track and assess the situation. Do you copy? I copy, but we're right in the middle of a live TV show, and I really can't spare any of my rangers right now. Uh, can you send somebody else? That's a negative, Ranger McGee. You have the best and brightest rangers working on your electronic field trip, and that's just what this situation needs. Okay, I'll find someone. Ranger McGee, clear. Well, everyone, uh, while I try to find someone who can track this grizzly bear, why don't you take a one-minute tour around Grand Teton National Park? Hello, I'm Superintendent Mary Gibson Scott and I'd like to welcome you to Grand Teton National Park. The first thing you notice about this place is the dramatic and rugged mountains. At 13,770 feet in elevation, the Grand Teton is the tallest in the range and mountaineers actually climb these towering peaks even in the winter. Named after an American Indian tribe, the Snake River winds its way along the sage-covered valley floor and provides opportunities for rafting and fishing. Hiking trails lead you through shady forests to glacial lakes or cascading creeks, where you might locate some of the diverse wildlife that live here. You may catch sight of bears, moose, bison, wolves, or snowshoe hares, weasels, bald eagles, and trumpeter swans. Grand Teton also preserves historic sites such as Meaners Ferry and Mormon Row. You can learn more about the park's wildlife, culture, and history by joining a ranger-led program, visiting the Indian Arts Museum, or exploring the Craig Thomas Discovery and Visitor Center. Today, you'll be learning about this amazing landscape and its wildlife through an electronic field trip. However, there is so much to see and do that I encourage you to visit and explore the park on your own. Well, welcome back from the one minute tour. And while you were away, I was able to find a ranger who's here on the show to track this grizzly bear. She was actually headed to the Alpine community with a wireless video transmission unit. But instead, she's gonna be on the job tracking this grizzly bear. 
So let's see, Elizabeth, Ranger Elizabeth, is the unit turned on? Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Diane. I've never really used one of these fancy wireless cameras before, so I hope you can see me just fine. I set out really early this morning to get to the top of Grand Teton before the show started. Oh, I was hiking and climbing and I pulled myself up every steep cliff. Elizabeth, it doesn't look like you're anywhere close to the top of the Grand Teton. Okay, fine. It was really cold this morning. So I stayed in bed. Maybe I hit my snooze a few times, so I actually just got out here. But the Alpine community is a really neat place, so I'll make you a deal. I'll go and track this grizzly bear if you promise to tell all the people watching about the Alpine community. And I'll even send you updates back on this wireless camera. So if this sounds like a fair deal, I'll get started tracking and you can get started. Talk to you later. All right, talk to you later, Elizabeth. That sounds like a fair deal. So Dylan, what do you think? Shall we sh tell our viewers all about the Alpine community? Sure. All right, well, let's get started. First of all, where is the Alpine community? The Alpine community is at tree line where the trees end in above. We are at right now 6,500 feet. Tree line is about 9,500 feet. All right, so that is where the Alpine community is. Now, when we think about any community, there are actually four characteristics that help us learn more about a community. These are sun, wind, moisture, and soil. And when we think about sunlight, we think about the intensity at which that sun is hitting um, the ground in any community. And also, we think about what elevation we're at, so how close to the sun are we? And then with wind, thinking about what direction the wind is coming from and also the speed at which it's coming towards that community. And moisture, moisture falls in the form of either rain or snow. And as we all know, all life needs water to survive. And then soil, what are the ingredients of soil? And those ingredients actually will tell you how rich the soil is. And that will also determine what plants can grow there and then what animals can feed off of those plants and also live in that community. We actually came up with an acronym for, to remember to the, the four characteristics. SWMS or SWIMS. So now that we know a little bit about the Alpine community, let's look at these characteristics. So Dylan, what about the SWIMS model for this community? Starting with sunlight. Sunlight, it, it is very bright or intense in the Alpine community. And how about the wind? It is very windy in the Alpine community because it's so exposed. And the moisture? The moisture varies depending on what type time of year it is. And finally, the soil. The soil is very rocky and there's not much of it. Right, so those are some of the, the SWIMS characteristics in the Alpine community. And because of those specific characteristics, the plants and animals have to survive, learn, learn how to adapt in order to survive in that community. And for example, plants that can grow there. For example, the white bark pine tree, wildflowers such as phlox, alpine forget-me-not, moss campion. And these plants that live in these harsh conditions, they actually have some adaptations, including the fact that they are dwarfed or very small so that they can stay out of those high velocity winds. They have another adaptation where their roots are kind of intertwined together to form a cushion or a mat. And that mat acts like a sponge so that anytime moisture is available, they're able to soak that in. So those are some of the plants that are in the Alpine community. How about some of the animals, Dylan? Two of my favorites are the bighorn sheep and the pika. The pika is a small rabbit, uh, I mean, it's a small animal in the rabbit family that makes a noise like this. Ee, ee, ee. They store haystacks in, under rocks to last them all winter long. And they shelter in the rocks from predators and wind. The bighorn sheep, both male and female, have horns like this one that are made out of um, hair and fingernail material, unlike the antler of a moose, which is made out of bone. 
So these are some of the animals and also we've just learned about some of the plants that call this community home. Now let's start to think back to those swims characteristics. We'd like to show you how we can measure them. Let's head on over. Oh. The first of our swims characteristics is sunlight. And sunlight, first of all, measure where you are. So what elevation are you in that community that you're measuring? And the other piece is how direct or indirect is that sunlight as it hits the ground. You can actually use this fancy little canopy grid to measure sunlight. And what is a canopy? Well, a canopy is actually when you look up, you see trees and branches and leaves there. Um, so that's the canopy. And Dylan's going to show us how you would use this in a community. You'd actually lie on your back, you'd point it up to the sky, and you would see what type of canopy is up there, what kind of leaves and branches are there. Thank you, Dylan. So for example, if we were to think about the Alpine community where we're above tree line, what, would, what do you expect you'd see through that? No canopy. Yeah, no canopy. And then on the other hand, in the forest community where we have lots of leaves, what might you see through that grid? Most of the grid covered by yeah. canopy. Yeah, so most of the grid covered by canopy. All right, so that's how we might measure moisture in the soil. How about our next swims characteristic of wind? With wind, you can tie a ribbon to the stick to see which way it's going, or just lick your finger, and whichever side gets cold fastest, it's the other side of the finger, which is the way that it's going. Then you can look at the direction of the wind by using a compass. All right, and moisture is next. And moisture, you can find that in the, you'll figure that out by um, looking at the soil. This is a fancy soil moisture meter that you would stick into the ground and get a reading from. But if you don't have something fancy like this, you can create your own experiment. And the way to do that is to create a scale. And a scale of one, which is the most dry, would be, say, a jar of sand. Get your hand in there and really feel. What does it feel like to be really dry? And then on the other end of the spectrum, say as a measurement of five, you could find some mucky, mucky mud like Dylan's pulling out of this jar and really get a feel for what is a five on that scale. Thanks Dylan for helping us with that. And then head out into a community and dig a hole and put your hand right in there and then see how you think that that relates on that scale from one to being really dry to five to being very, very moist. All right, and next we have soil. soil. A way you can measure soil is to use a fancy sifter like this. But if you don't have, uh, well, uh, if you put, dig out dirt from the ground, you shake it in here, and then what you can see all the ingredients in the dirt. Or you can just use a strainer to get the idea of it. Right, so you measure these, these different characteristics in a community, and then what you can do from there is you can go ahead and hypothesize. Based on that soil and all of these characteristics, what type of, of plants can live there? And then, of course, what, what animals would live there and feed off of those plants? So we encourage you to try this at home in your own communities. Well, we've learned about the four characteristics, swims, specifically the Alpine community, and we'll, next we'll be taking calls live. We'll be right back. Coming up, will Ranger Elizabeth find the grizzly bear, or will we have to send someone else to find Ranger Elizabeth? And our experts take your questions live on the air. Stay tuned. This week on The Marmots, Chuck and Blanche Marmot move into a new tunnel system and things get crazy when they meet their new neighbor, Andre. Hey, welcome to the neighborhood, you big rodent. Will Chuck stir up trouble when his feisty friends call him yellow-bellied? Yellow-bellied? Your mama was yellow-bellied. And who sneaks up on Blanche while she's sunning on a rock? Sorry, Mrs. M, didn't mean to scare you. Just want to see who this long tail belonged to. Tune in for the final episode before the marmots disappear until May. Time for hard-hitting action this weekend with two big AFL games. At one, the Eagles meet the Ravens. The Eagles may be bald, but they'll pack a punch for the soaring, diving, aerobatic maneuvers of the Ravens. 
Then at four, the lions meet the bears. A rare treat. These lions, mountain lions technically, are rarely seen. And the bears outfitted in their namesake black uniforms will be very hungry with hibernation right around the corner. Tune in for another thrilling weekend with the AFL. And now back to Tales from the Tetons, live from Grand Teton National Park. Welcome back. While you were away, we've been getting some great phone calls coming on in. Our first caller is Shania from Pennsylvania. Shania from Pennsylvania, you can say a question, please. How can bighorn rams survive budding each other at 20 miles per hour? That's a good question. Do you want to answer that, Diane? I'll go ahead and answer that question for you. They actually have a skeletal stu structure, not just in their skulls, but all the way down their spines that can handle that compression when they come at each other at 20 miles per hour. So an amazing adaptation so that they can survive that during the mating season. Great question, thank you. Our next caller is Rachel from Texas. Rachel from Texas, you can please ask your question. Does a bear go to a special place to die? That would be a great question for Emily and Mike in the forest community. You know, that is a good question, um, but I'm not so sure. Mike, do you know? Oh, that's a great one, Rachel, and I'm not sure about that one. Do they go to a special place to die? I don't believe so, and I think that they uh, will just die uh, just of natural causes. Hopefully, that would be the case, but uh, they don't go back to their home range or anything like that to uh, die in a special place. We might want to refer to that to our bank of experts, but we'll take it back to you, Diane and Dylan. Thank you. All right, our next caller is Melanie from Texas. Melanie, please go ahead with your question. What happens when you go to um, track bears or other animals? Well, let's go ahead and refer that again back to Mike and Emily about tracking bears. Mike, would you like to take that um, one? That's a great question, Melanie. Uh, what happens when we track bears? Uh, we don't have all the bears, both black and grizzly bears, tracked in Grand Teton National Park. Of course, they're wild animals. We have a good idea of the numbers of them. We'll track them. We'll find out how old they are, the sex of them, if they're a mother, if they have cubs. We'll keep an eye of where their home range is. But if they're tracked and they happen to get pick up some bad habits by, uh, by humans and getting into human food, we may have to relocate those bears to another area. Area. If we've done that two or three times and that bear ends up uh, coming back for, for more rewards or human food, that we may have to unfortunately destroy that bear. Great question. Back to you, Di Dylan and Diane. Our next, our next, um, our next caller is Brooklyn, Brooklyn from, from Missouri. Missouri. That's right. Go ahead, Brooklyn, with your question, please. Um, do the moose shed their antlers? Do what animal shed their antlers? Do moose? Do moose shed their antlers with the blood vessels? Thank you, Brooklyn. What do you think? Where should we send that one, Dylan? To the wetland community with Rachel and Siler. Oh, uh, they do. Yes, they do. And which, which, the males or the females grow antlers? Do you know that, Siler? The males? Yeah, just the males grow their antlers and they can grow up to an inch a day in the height of the growing season. They'll lose those antlers in December or January and then they start regrowing them in the spring, right? Yep. All right, back to you, Diane and Dylan. Our next caller is Ariel from, Ariel from Illinois. Ariel from Illinois, please say our question. Um, hi. Uh, how many how many mountains are there at the Grand Teton? That would be a great question. I think um, Kristen or Kaylin could definitely answer that question. That is a great question, Ariel. Um, there's about 12 peaks that are over 12,000 feet in the Teton Range, but there's a lot of other smaller peaks. If you wanted an exact answer, I would maybe check in with our bank of experts online. Back to you, Dylan and Diane. All right, our next caller is Zach from Pennsylvania. Zach, please go ahead with your question. Um, up in the outline, why is it so cold whenever the sun is so bright and strong? Want to take that one, Dylan? I couldn't exactly hear it. The question was, is when you're high up in the alpine, why is it so cold when the sun is actually so bright and strong? 
Oh, because it's colder when you get up higher. Yeah. Yeah, as you go up in elevation, the temperature just goes down. Thanks for that great question. And actually, that's all the questions we have time for right now, but please continue to, call, to send your emails into our bank of experts, and we will be doing one more question and answer session later in the show, so keep those calls coming. All right, now, before we start talking again about our communities, let's go check back in with Elizabeth. I've actually um, been able to establish video connection with her again, and Elizabeth, I have got some updated information just a few seconds ago. We found out that the grizzly bear is actually in the forest community now. Are you anywhere near the forest community, Elizabeth? Am I near the forest community? Of course, I'm in it. I think this is a pretty young forest because all the trees surrounding me are really small. But someday, this huge expanse of tiny shrub-like trees, rocky soil, and tiny grasses will surely grow up to be a towering forest. But now that I'm here, I better get busy looking for that grizzly bear I was sent to find. Okay, Elizabeth. Well, I'm actually not sure that you're in the forest. Those little trees you've been looking at appear to be sagebrush. Uh, so continue on looking for that forest community where that grizzly bear is hanging out. And uh, while you're there though, and while you mention it, why don't we go ahead and talk with Kristen and Kaylin in more detail about the sagebrush community. Okay. Um, as you can see, we're here in the sagebrush community. Um, the sagebrush community is the largest and widespread valley here in the park. That's right, and you can see we have uh, lots of plants all around us here. All these gray green shrubs that you can see are the sagebrush plants. And if we take a closer look at this plant, it can tell us a little bit more about those swims characteristics that Diane and Dylan were mentioning earlier. So let's take a closer look at the plant here. Uh, the first characteristic is sunlight. And uh, you can imagine on a sunny day, the the sagebrush flats would get a lot of sun. Uh, it's a very open area, there's not much shade, and also they're, um, you know, it's a big open flat area, so there's no aspect to deal with. So you can see on the sagebrush plant here, all um, the leaves are kind of fuzzy, and that fuzz sort of acts as a uh, sunscreen to help the plant reflect some of that sunlight away from them so they don't get too much sunlight. Uh, also, you can see most of the parts of the plant sort of face upwards. All the leaves are pointing up into the sky, and that is also so that the plant uh, doesn't get too much sun. If you imagine yourself lying down flat on the floor, you're going to get more sunlight and probably get a little bit more burnt by the sun. But if you're standing up, not as much of you gets burnt. So when a plant just kind of faces everything up, it doesn't get too much sunlight that way. Also, you can see most of the plants out in the sagebrush community are pretty low to the ground um, and they have pretty small leaves and all of that helps them deal with wind because it is a pretty open flat area. It can get kind of windy. Um, so that's how they deal with that characteristic. What about the other two? Uh, moisture and soil, they kind of go together, but with the moisture, there's only about 10 inches of rain and snow melt um, every year in the sagebrush community because there's not much water, the sagebrush plant has really long roots which are called tap roots and they go really far down into the earth to try and find water and then the ones that are sticking out are um, surface roots mm -hmm. and they go outward to try and find the water. And then with the soil, even when they do get some water, it doesn't hold very much water, it just drains through because the soil is very rocky and sandy. That's right, and what other kind of plants can we see around us here? Um, there's about 100 different kinds of species of plants here in the sagebrush community and a lot of them are grasses and different kinds of wildflowers. That's right, so there's a lot of different kind of plants that we would find out here. It uh, looks initially like it's just all sagebrush, um, but in fact, even with all the sagebrush that's out here, there's actually only two animals in the sagebrush community that eat the sagebrush plant. Uh, those are the pronghorn antelope, um, which are the fastest land animal in North America. So they like these really huge open spaces to be able to run fast in. Uh, and also the sage grouse. And if you come to Grand Teton National Park in the early spring, you might get lucky to see a male sage grouse in its display and they get all puffed up. Uh, so that's a really cool thing to be able to see as well. 
Um, but there's one animal that we're going to be talking about today that eats these grasses in addition to lots of other animals like elk and mule deer that might graze through, uh, you into ground squirrels that might burrow underground, and predators. We had a coyote come he through here earlier. There's also wolves and badgers that might be out here looking for prey as well. But what animal are we going to talk about today? Um, we're going to talk about the bison. As a lot of people know the bison as buffalo, but actually it is bison. They got buffalo from the water buffalo, and they eat most of the grasses here in the sagebrush community. That's right, and let's take a look at a little piece, or a big piece, of a bison here. This is the skull of a bison, and uh, you can see here this is a pretty large animal. Their heads are really big. Uh, is that kind of a heavy, heavy thing to hold there, Keith? Yeah, it's about 10 to 15 pounds, and that's just the skull. That's right, so pretty big animal with a big head here, but they need that big head because snow can accumulate quite a bit on the valley floor here. So they use that head kind of like a big snow plow to kind of go back and forth and, and move the snow away to get down to the grasses that they want to eat. Um, you can also see kind of the things sticking up here. These are the bony cores of their horns, and all bison have horns, both males and females, but you can use those as a way to tell the difference between male and female. Uh, a male bison is going to have bigger horns that stick out further from their head. A female bison is going to have smaller horns that are kind of curved inwards towards their head a little bit more. So it's one way you can tell the difference. The males will sometimes use these horns to sort of fight with each other and push each other around to impress the females during the mating season, which is in late summer. And uh, you can imagine that's a pretty amazing spectacle to see two male bison, such a large animal, kind of crashing into each other and fighting. They're really big animals. They can weigh um, between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds uh, and, and can easily be about six and a half feet high. So they're a big animal. And because of that, you wouldn't think that they're necessarily a very fast animal, but they can actually run 30 miles an hour and they can jump six feet, uh, which is a good thing to keep in mind if you're out there watching bison. It's important to keep your distance because they're a lot more agile than you would think them to be. Uh, but have there always been these bison in this area, Kaylin? Um, no, there used to be about 60 million buffalo or bison here in the park, um, or actually here on the land. Um, it was the biggest herd of animals that's ever been on the planet. Now, after they started shooting the buffalo for sport, um, they just kept on shooting and shooting the bison. And one of the people that shot a lot of the bison was Buffalo Bill Cody, and he killed about 4,250 bison in about two years. Um, after all the shooting was done, there was only about 20 bison left. Um, but now they have regained, and there's about 1,200 bison here at Grand Teton National Park, and there's a little over 5,000 bison um, in Yellowstone National Park. Ow! Look what I've done! This pond wasn't here a few months ago. Uh, it sounds like we might need to check in with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what are, you, what are you up to? Well, I was going to call and give you an update, but I've come across this miracle out in the middle of the park. A giant pond <sighs> appeared out of nowhere. Last summer when I was out here, this was nowhere to be found. But look! Ta-da! Here it is! So those of you back at home base, be careful because these ponds appear out of nowhere. Okay, thanks Elizabeth, that's good to know. It sounds like maybe you've come upon a beaver pond, uh, which is not really in the forest community. Do you think you can make your way around the pond and keep looking for the grizzly? Yep, I think I can find my way around this pond. I feel like I'm getting really close to the forest. So when I find it, I'll let you know. Talk to you later. Okay, well hopefully we'll hear again from you soon, Elizabeth. Uh, maybe while she keeps looking for the grizzly in the forest community, we can send it over to Rachel and Siler to tell us about the wetlands. We sure can tell you about the wetlands. Again, I'm Rachel. And I'm Siler. And we're here in one of the most beautiful spots in the park next to a beaver pond. We've got actually a real beaver dam and a beaver lodge just behind us. And this morning we saw a beaver swimming around that lodge. Unfortunately, it's not out right now, but we're gonna talk a lot about these beautiful areas, what a wetland is and what you find there. So let's start off. Siler, can you explain to the folks in the classrooms, what is a wetland? Well, a wetland is a place where the water can hold the roots 
It's a place where the plants can hold the water in their uh, root and can stand the water in their roots. And it's a place where water is present for all or part of the year. That's right. And so from that definition, you can imagine we find wetlands all over the place. We find wetlands all the way up in wet meadows at the alpine areas up in the tops of our peaks and all the way down here on the valley floor. And I'll bet if you step outside, it wouldn't take you too long to find a wetland near your home also. Now, going back to the SWIMS acronym that we've been talking about today, Siler, what kind of sunlight do we find in these wetland areas? The sunlight varies in the wetlands. Yeah, sometimes it's shady, sometimes it's wide open spots. And how about the wind in wetland areas? The wind also varies. Yeah, lots mm -hmm. of variations in these areas. And this is an easy one. How about the moisture in a wetland? Wet. All right, very wet. Sometimes that water is just a couple inches deep, but sometimes you've got a few feet of standing water there all year round. And with all of that moisture, we get a certain type of soil there. And what kind of soil is it? Um, it's very rich. Yes, very rich. Lots of good nutrients in these soils, which makes a lot of vegetation grow there. And these wetlands are great for the animals because of what, Siler? Um, well, they provide a great hiding spot and food for the animals. They do. Wonderful hiding spots, which is important for a lot of young in the wild. They need good spots to hide out and eat and get stronger while they're growing. Now, what kinds of plants have we come across that, you, that you've seen in these wetland areas? Um, well, there are willows, um, yellow pond lilies, and lots of beautiful wildflowers. There sure are. Lots of wonderful wildflowers like Indian paintbrush and marsh marigold. Now, these plants, a lot of different animals like eating these plants. And one animal we find in a lot of wetland areas are moose. And when they're eating, moose love eating willows. And Siler, if you'll pretend Siler's a willow shrub here, and a moose might come up and clamp onto the branch on a willow and shear off all of the leaves in one swoop. Those moose really love eating the willows and in the winter if there's no leaves they'll just chew on the twigs and branches of those willows. Now we've got a moose antler here to show you and Siler will you pick that up? Ooh, they're pretty heavy. How, how does that feel picking that up? It's heavy. Yeah how would you like having two of those on your head? That would really hurt. Yeah, I'd probably have a headache after about 30 seconds, I think. Thanks, so uh, you can put that back down. Now we find moose in all different types of wetlands. Again, they really love eating all the, the plants and shrubs that we find in these wetland areas. And moose are excellent at swimming. You know how fast they can swim? Six miles per hour. They sure can. And what's another animal that can swim six miles an hour? The beaver. Yeah, I think we could enter them into our Olympic team next time and see who would win. Now, these guys go swimming and they like swimming and they build dams. Why do, actually, why don't you tell us why they can, why they build dams? Um, well, they build the, da the dams to um, clog up some of the water so they can um, swim around everything they need because they're much better swimmers than they are um, on land. They sure are. And now it's time for our your turn activity. So you folks in the classroom, you've already got your supplies and we're going to walk over to our table and show you the supplies once again. So start getting your stuff together while we come over here to our supplies. Now we're going to have Dylan and Diane join us in this activity. So Diane, do you guys have all of your supplies together? Yep, we sure do. All right. And while you guys are gathering your stuff, Siler, why don't you tell us what are all these things? Okay, well, you can use toothpicks for sticks. Mm -hmm. You can use, you can cut up some straws for logs. And you just use a, about a handful of rocks. Perfect. And you can use Play-Doh or clay. Play-Doh works a little better um, for mud. Mm -hmm. And about a half a pitcher of water. All right, and then what's this thing? This is a gutter which you use to build your dam in. in and you build your dam about four inches in, which is about at this line here. Um, and then you build it from there. Great. And you folks in the classroom, you're going to need 
some books or something to put under the gutter so that you can have an angle so the water will roll downhill when you're testing your dams. Now, Siler, what, while they're building their dams, they're gonna wanna build them so that they do what things? Well, you want the, uh, you want it to make a pond, have mm -hmm. a little drizzle, and you don't want it to burst. That's right. So while you're building your dams, keep those three things in mind and get to it. You guys have all the supplies together. Start building those dams, and we're going to come back in a little bit and test out the dams. So Diane, Diane and Dylan, you guys get going on your project. OK. All right. Now, while everyone's building their dams, we're going to talk a little bit about beavers a little bit more. And like we said before, beavers are specially adapted to living in wet environments. And we've actually invited Emily to join us today. And Emily's got a few strange things on her right now. And she's actually dressed with all of the adaptations that beavers have to survive where they do. So Siler, why don't you tell us a little bit about the strange outfit that she has on? Well, there are, these are the teeth which um, beavers use to chew down trees and um, other kinds of bark. Mm -hmm. um, and they have webbed feet which help them swim. And then they have a tail um, she, over yeah. there which they use as a rudder to help them swim. And they also have clear eyelids which help them see underwater. And these are just a few of the adaptations that beavers have so that they can swim everywhere they need to and get to all of the resources that they need. Now those teeth are really helpful in, in chewing down willows. Sometimes they do uh, chew down trees as big as six inches. And again, we've got a great lodge behind us that, can, that shows how big these trees can be that they're using. Thank you, Emily, for joining us today and for dressing up as a beaver for us. All right, well, we're going to get back to our Your Turn activity and test out our dam. So, Siler, why don't you grab the one we built earlier? And Diane and Dylan, are you guys ready to test your dam? Yep. Yep, we're just about ready. Okay, so we'll, folks in the classroom, if you haven't had time yet to finish your dam, don't worry. Take the time after the program ends. And again, what we're looking for is to make a small pond, to have a trickle coming through, and also for your dam not to burst. So Diane and Dylan, are you guys ready to pour the water? You betcha, we've gotten started already. <laughs> oh, they're beating us to it. All right, so let's catch up and start pouring our water. And you guys in the classroom, if you can see, we're looking for a little bit of a pond. We've definitely got a trickle. How about you guys, Diane? How's our pond, Dylan? It's pretty small, but our trickle's a little, it's about medium. It's about medium? So yeah, and it hasn't broken. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like you guys met the qualifications for making a dam. Siler, how did our dam do here? It did pretty well. It still has a little bit of water in it that doesn't seem to be going through. Oh, oh so we so. might have a permanent pond here, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll All probably right. make it through. <laughs> All right, so again, if you guys didn't have time to finish your dams, this gives you a little idea of one style of dam. And again, you guys could try this a few times and improve on your dams and Again, make that pond a little bit of trickle and not bursting your dam. So Siler and I want to thank you for joining us in the wetlands. And now back to you, Diane. Thanks, Rachel and Siler. Well, we've just learned then about wetlands and the sagebrush community. We're getting ready for a break, but when we come back, we'll be taking your calls live and we'll see you then. Coming up. With time running out, will Range Elizabeth find her way to the forest community or just end up right back where she started? And our experts take more of our questions live on the air. Stay tuned. Dropping this week on Mountain Records, the Wolf Pack's greatest hits includes the classics. A Carnivore's Life, This Is My Territory, Keep Out, and I'm No Coyote. The 1999 Billboard Smash It, we're moving to the Tetons. Plus, two never before released tracks. I killed an elk for dinner, and a cover of Who Let the Dogs Out? The Wolf Pack's greatest hits in stores now. 
The Jackson, Wyoming Area Society for Careful Animal Tracking is currently recruiting new members. Join us Saturday for an information session. Grab some fresh coffee and plop yourself into a chair to hear about the latest animal tracking techniques from animal expert Mark Anur. Upcoming meeting topics include scent tracking with Clara Alpice, animal footprints with Derek Ung, and animal habitats with Dr. Brenda Oppings. Keep your eyes out for SCAT. We'll be dropping into a national park near you. And now back to Tales from the Tetons, live from Grand Teton National Park. Well, welcome back. While you were gone, we've been getting some more great phone calls. Our first caller is Ellie from Texas. Ellie from Texas, please ask your question. Are there fences around the park that block the animals from going into certain areas? Can I hear that question again? Are there fences around the park that block the animals from going into certain areas? That would be a great question for the sagebrush community with Kaylin and Kristen. That is a really great question, Ellie. Um, thanks for that. There actually aren't really any fences. Uh, we are part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem here. So to our north is Yellowstone National Park and we have national forests on every side of us almost and the National Elk Refuge south of us here. So they can wander in and out of any of those sections and go in and out of the different communities pretty much as they please. So they, they're kind of on their own there. That's a great question though. Back to you, Diane and Dylan. All right, our next caller is Randy from California. Randy, please tell us your question. How do how do bighorn sheep survive at that altitude with, without getting problems in their lungs? Without getting problems in their lungs. Well, you know, it's interesting. They actually adapt similar to humans. So when humans, when you come to visit this park from sea level, your body actually is gonna react to that. And it's the same with, um, with uh, the bighorn sheep. They are initially um, gonna react to that higher elevation if they've been at a lower one, say maybe in the winter feeding. But we have an amazing capacity as animals to get used to that lack of oxygen or that less oxygen that's in the air. And so bighorn sheep are really well adapted for that. Super question, thank you. Our next caller is Hallie from Texas. Hallie from Texas, please ask your question. The cat. Go ahead, Hallie. So is the cat someone to stay invade their natural habitat? Can we repeat that question, please? So a moose attacks someone if they invade their natural habitat. Well, let's go over to the wetlands with Rachel and Siler to answer that question. All right, well, moose could attack people. Um, normally, they, they just go about their business of eating in the wetlands, um, but sometimes folks get a little too close to get a good picture, so we urge everybody to use the telephoto lenses that they get for Christmas and stay pretty far away from these animals because they aren't, especially a mother moose and a calf, she will not be too happy if you get a little too close. Back to you, Diane and Dylan. Thank you. All right, our next caller is Autumn from Illinois. Autumn, please let us know what your question is. Who is the greatest predator in the Tetons, wolves or bears? Ooh, good question. Let's send that to our forest community with Emily and Mike. Very good question. Actually, it's probably bears, but Mike, would you like to say anything about that? Well, that is a very good question. It'd be hard to compare which is the better predator. Of course, the bear is a lot bigger, and especially the grizzly bear. But uh, the wolves, when they hunt in packs, might be more effective in hunting them down. So I'd call that one a toss-up between the bears and the wolves' packs. That's a great question. But back to you, Dylan and Diane. Our next um, person is Seth from New York. Seth from New York, please see your question. Where do the alpine animals migrate in the winter? Well, they don't, some of them actually hibernate, but I don't think really any of them ever migrate. All right, our next question is from Mari from Virginia. Mari, please ask your question. Can water buffaloes, can water buffaloes breathe, breathe underwater to catch fish? Which animal are you asking about? Water buffalo. Water buffalo. Water buffalo. 
Let's send that to the sagebrush community. Yeah, I don't know that. Okay, well you might have gotten a little bit confused when Kaylin was talking about the fact that our bison here, sometimes people call them buffalo because of buffalo that you would find in Africa. So when people first came out here and saw bison in the west, they were sort of reminded of water buffalo and uh, called them buffalo because of that. But actually our bison here are bison and they're out on the sagebrush, so you wouldn't necessarily find them underwater. Good question though. Let's send you back to Diane and Dylan. Okay, our last and next caller is Tiffany from New York. Tiffany from New York, please call. I mean, please ask your question. Tiffany from New York, please ask your question. Well, it sounds like we've lost Tiffany, but thanks for all your questions and please continue to send those emails in and we'll be back with another question and answer a little later. But before we do that, let's go ahead and get check, check back in with Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, let's see what she's gotten herself into or where maybe where she is. Elizabeth, hello, where are you? I'm finally in the forest community, Diane, and I'm pretty confident this time because look at all the trees. I do have one question. Now that I'm here, um, what exactly does a grizzly bear look like? Elizabeth, have you been tracking this grizzly bear all along and not really knowing what it looked like? Well, let me give you a few tips. A grizzly bear has a huge hump on its shoulder. It also has its profile and its face is dish shaped. And um, let's see, it smells like dirt and uh, grizzly bears growl. So listen for that. Check, I got it. I'm gonna start looking around the forest community and see what I can find. And if I see something, I'll let you know. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hopefully the next time we see you, you'll have found that grizzly bear. Let's learn some things about the forest with Mike and Emily. Hey, thanks, Dylan and Diane. Uh, Mike here and Emily. We're in the, uh, we're actually, we're at the edge of uh, going into the forest community. And there are many forest communities here in Grand Teton National Park and the mountains in the valley. It covers a lot of terrain. The forest communities go all the way from the valley floor, which around here is about 6,500 feet, all the way up to just below Alpine or, or the tree communities of the tree line rather up there. And uh, there are basically two types of forest communities that we can find here in Jackson Hole and the Teton Range. Emily, can you tell us a little bit about those type of forest communities? Well, there's deciduous forests, which are the forests that have the trees that their leaves shed every year, such as cottonwood and aspen. And there's also coniferous trees, such as uh, pines and evergreens like lodgepole pine, spruce, and firs. Excellent. Great. Uh, you remember those environmental factors, those characteristics of the communities that we were talking about earlier, Emily? Sun, wind, moisture, and soil. Right, and in the forest community, and when we get closer in in the, in the center of the forest, what's the sunlight in there like? There's, it's a lot more dim than it is anywhere else because of all the trees surrounding it. Right, the, all the trees that blocks out the sun, it also blocks out the canopy of the forest, blocks out the wind, so it's a lot more calm in the, in the forest community. And also there's a lot more moisture without that much sun getting to the floor of the forest floor there. Uh, there's also uh, the, the soil uh, is retains the moisture and, um, and what about the soils? Well, it's a lot richer with nutrients because of decomposing plants and animals. Excellent. Good job, Emily. Well, there's a lot of animals that live in the forest community that spend their whole time, their whole lives right in the community and never leave uh, and visit another uh, community. Can you name, identify some of those we might see today, Emily? Red squirrel and pine martin. The red squirrel is a type of tree squirrel and the pine martin is the red squirrel's predator. Right, pine martin is a type of weasel, so the red squirrel doesn't hibernate and needs to watch out for the pine, pine martin that might prey on that. But there are a lot of animals that pass through the forest community on the way to the sage and the wetland communities. What are some of those bigger animals that we might see just passing through the forest? There's mule deer, elk, moose, and bears such as grizzly and black bears. Hey, hey, someone turn on my camera. I found the grizzly. Oh, hey, hey, just a second. I great, I think we hear from Elizabeth. She found that grizzly bear. I was walking around that clearing over there, and when I came around the corner, just 30 yards in front of me was the grizzly. Look! 
Oh, excellent, excellent. Good job, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, but Emily, there are two types of bears in the park. How do we know that Elizabeth has actually found a grizzly bear? You're right, Mike. There are two types, such as grizzly and black bears. The color of a black bear could be many different, such as brown, cinnamon, and even blonde colored. And, and the claws, the claws of the, of the bears are a lot different too. As you can tell, the grizzly bear has a lot longer claws than the black bear does. And the hump behind a grizzly bear's ear is another way to distinguish if you're looking at a grizzly bear or a black bear. Right, the hump is right behind the ear, or the ear, ears and the neck actually by the shoulders there. And the ears of a grizzly bear in proportion to the animal are a lot smaller than the, the ears of a black bear. The black bear's ears are a lot larger. And I think we mentioned earlier about the concave. If we were able, to, if we were lucky enough to see a grizzly bear from the side, we'd see a concave or a dish shape on the face. And of course the grizzly bear, just the tips of the hairs are kind of a golden whitish gray color that gives it that grizzled color. So what do bears eat, Mike? Oh, good question. Uh, bears, black bears and grizzly bears are omnivores, and that means they bo eat both plants and animals. Now the plant parts they eat would be flowers and leaves. They'll even eat the bulbs and the roots of the plants. They'll also eat berries. This time of year particularly, they'll be eating the berries. They also like to eat insects. Uh, they'll eat insects. They'll go up way up high in the mountains on the alpine community and eat moths that are ripe up there and eat the moths. They also, in the forest community, like to grub around in the decomposing logs and uh, all the rot and they get the ants, uh, larvae and maga, maggots. And, uh, and uh, they also hibernate. They're true, well actually they're not true hibernators, but so this time of year they're trying to get, collect as many berries as possible for food for a high protein diet with lots of sugar so they can make it through the long winters here. Now bears are opportunistic and that means that they'll eat just about anything that's put in front of them. Right Mike, so that means we humans need, always need to be bear aware. When hiking in bear country you should make a noise, stay in groups, and store your food properly because a fed bear is a dead bear. Right, and what Emily means by a fed bear is a dead bear is that if bears pick up bad habits from humans feeding them, we may have to re relocate them and if they get a couple, three bad strikes against them and keep relocating those bears that have, have been rewarded with human foods, we'll have to euthanize or destroy that bear. So that's why we say a fed bear is a, dare, a dead bear. So whenever we're visiting our backcountry in Grand Teton National Park, we encourage visitors to use these bear canisters. These are bear proof devices that uh, don't allow, use a little locking device, you put your food in there and so the bears cannot get into the food that you're carrying into the back backcountry. And what happens if you see a bear, Emily? Well, you should never run and walk back slowly and our behavior should be based on the bear's behavior. Right, and so what, by that you mean that uh, our behavior should be based on the bear's behavior. If the bear's being defensive, which would mean it's protecting its food or young, then you should walk back slowly, and if it still comes towards you, it may be falsely charging you. So you should play dead, and as the last defense, use your bear spray. Exactly right. So keep talking to it, slowly back away. If it does look like there's going to be an attack, and it looks like it's just trying to defend itself, the bear wants to scare you and get you out of way from its food source or its cubs, then play dead or if you have some bear spray with you you'd use this device as a bear spray as a last resort this is an oil based uh, pepper spray that you can spray it's not something you spray on yourself like deodorant or anything to repel the bears you just spray it in front of the bears and hopefully that will be the last resort uh, before you uh, are attacked it looks like you're going to be attacked by a bear well great work Elizabeth uh, Thanks for tracking that bear for us. Excellent job. Good job. All in a day's work, my friend. All in a day's work. No task is too tall for a ranger like me. I'm the best in the business. Now, if you could just tell dispatch that everything is okay here. No visitors are in danger, and the grizzly seems fit and healthy. So I'll just head back to the visitor center. I um... Could somebody tell me how to get to the visitor center? I don't exactly know where I am. Well, good luck finding the visitor center, Elizabeth. Great job, Elizabeth. Uh, hey, by the way, we'll call dispatch and let them know that you and the bear are okay. Back to you, Dylan and Diane. We've learned about SWIM's characteristics. 
We find in all Grand Teton National Parks community, the forest community, the sagebrush community, the wetland community, and the alpine community. Do you have any of those where you live? Um, here in Grand Teton National Park is protected by the National Park Service. And as a National Park Service National Park Service Ranger, it is my job to protect this national park and all of those communities. But you know what? National parks belong to all of us. And so it's not just my responsibility, it's also all of yours to help protect these national parks that you visit. Dylan, what are some ways that you can actually help to protect these parks? Don't litter. Respect wildlife by not giving them human food and keep your distance away from them. Be careful with fire. Put out your campfire. Leave things where they are so they can play their role in nature and so other people can see them. Great, Dylan. These are great ideas. And also, why is it important to actually protect these natural areas? It's important to pre protect these natural areas because animals need to have habitats and humans are just one part of the web of life. And we need to respect the other parts of the web too. That's right, absolutely. And you know the other role about these natural places is that as humans we really need places to visit and explore and take some time to relax and recreate and really most importantly to let nature restore our spirit. And hopefully when you do visit these national parks and other natural places in your backyard, you're going to be inspired to help protect them and preserve them for future generations. These communities that we have here, we want you to come and explore these amazing animals and plants that call this place home. Well, we're running out of time here. So before we leave, we'd like to again thank our sponsors, Ball State University, Best Buy Children's Foundation, the National Park Foundation, and the National Park Service. Um, we, um, uh, make sure you turn into our next electronic field trip, the nine who made a difference. Thanks so much for coming and tuning in today. Take care. Goodbye.